In these modern times of global communication, smartphone recording, Skype and email, it is all too easy to forget that the huge collections of songs, stories and superstitions that have been lodged in many fine institutions came about only because of individuals who recognised the importance of our cultures and set out to record them. Part of the remit that I've set myself for the Folklore Podcast is to recall our forgotten history and record the new. But we must also be absolutely instrumental in giving thanks for and celebrating those who came before and devoted themselves to doing the same. I'm Mark Norman, folklore researcher and author. On this episode of the Folklore Podcast, I am joined by Cindy Campbell-Stone from the Helen Creighton Folklore Society to discuss Canada's First Lady of Folklore. Folklore. The beliefs, traditions and culture of the people. Passed on in the most part through the spoken word, folklore expresses our values, our shared ideas with others. It is both how we were and how we are. Without a record, our customs and traditions may become lost to us in the present. But under the surface, we still draw on them. We still know. It's time to recall our forgotten history, and to record the new. This is the Folklore Podcast. Hi, Cindy. Uh, Welcome to the Folklore Podcast. Oh, thank you. It's great to be here. Good. It's it's nice to talk to you. Now, today um, we're going to talk about Helen Creighton and about the Helen Creighton Folklore Society. Um, Could you perhaps start by just saying what your role is within that society? Uh, Well, I'm on the board of the Helen Creighton Folklore Society, and I'm the the vice chair, vice president, and I'm also the storytelling liaison. So I I uh, liaison with any national storytelling events and other storytellers across the country, as well as the local ones. And uh, quite often folk songs, you know, uh, storytelling go together. So I sort of am the in-between for that. Excellent. So for those who don't know, or for those that need a bit more background before we go any further, tell us who was Helen Creighton? What did she do? What did she collect uh, within the folklore sphere? Well, Helen Creighton was a folklorist, and she was Canada's first lady of folklore. Now, she was born over 100 years ago on September 5th, 1899, so we just kind of celebrated her her, her birthday, and um, she was actually born with a call over her face, which is, if your uh, listeners know, a call is a piece of skin that is uh, born over the face of the baby, and quite often, especially back then, they would take that piece of skin off, And the doctor would put it on a piece of fool's cap paper and let it dry, it would be let dry out. But the mother would often keep that piece of skin because it was considered good luck uh, for the rest of the child's life. And it was also said that the child would be uh, protected for the rest of their life as long as the call was preserved. And the call also meant that the child likely had the second sight as well. Yes, and in fact, you, you find this a lot, don't you, within within kind of traditional witchcraft. There is, there is still very much an element of um, this kind of protection and good fortune attached to the call. 
Yes, yes, for sure. And actually, um, sailors who went to sea quite often uh, would purchase calls uh, before they went out to sea because it was considered um, good luck and that sailor would not drown at sea as long as he had a call in his possession. So there was a lot of superstitions surrounding that kind of thing. And Helen certainly had her share of sort of supernatural experiences if you will she she did believe in the second sight because quite often there were things that happened in her life that she could not explain um her family was sitting around the house one evening playing cards and they heard three knocks uh, upon the wall and they thought it was someone at the door and they went to look and there was no one there and they heard the three knocks again a couple of times more and still searched the whole house all around the outside of the house no one there and of course uh, superstition is that three knocks means that there is a um a possible death of someone that you know so it was considered quite an omen uh, in helen's day and of course as the stories all go, after you hear the three knocks, there is someone that you know that does die. And that happened in Helen's case. A member of the family who was away had passed. So so this area of kind of folklore and, and the supernatural and superstition, uh, we'll, we'll come to back to a little bit later on, because I know that that kind of becomes a part of, of Helen's story. Um, yes. yes. What what? did she primarily collect so she has this kind of grounding in folklore from a very early age if you like and it's very much with her so she sets out to to start to collect folklore from her area what exactly is she looking for well uh she like she grew up with that kind of folklore as many people do uh, and did in, in nova scotia uh they brought it from you know the home the homeland so to speak but she really didn't know what she wanted to do with life uh, she wanted to write a book she knew that um and it wasn't until actually 1928 that she decided that she was going to go and collect uh, folk songs she had a friend named Henry Monroe, who was superintendent, superintendent of schools, and uh, he directed her to um, the uh, Roy McKenzie, who had gone around Nova Scotia and collected some folk songs, and he had published a book on folk songs of Nova, of Nova Scotia. And um, Helen then became interested and thought, well, yeah, maybe she could do that. She could go around and collect folk songs. Now, she really didn't know what a folk song was, uh, but she just thought it was an interesting thing to do. So she was kind of mulling it around in her head, and then she was at a picnic one day down in the Eastern Passage, and uh, she decided to ask some of the people who were there if anybody knew any of the folk songs, any of the old songs. And sure enough, uh, she was directed towards uh, Hartland's Point, which is far down the Eastern Passage, and to Enos Hartland, who apparently had as many songs as there are stars in the sky. <laughs> so uh, when she... Uh, she collected the songs from him. He had a he had a big re repertoire of different songs, um, and she was quite thrilled thrilled to get that. And she also he told her some stories too, and she didn't realize until later that uh, the stories were were worthwhile as well. But she made notes and she kept her notes, and sure enough, years later she she ended up publishing some of those stories that she collected from from many many people. But uh, that was sort of her first encounter and it sort of set her on the way to uh, starting to collect stories all around the province of Nova Scotia, uh, a little bit in Prince Edward Island and New Brunswick. Um, she didn't venture too far uh, because there, of course, there were other folklorists who were collecting in the other provinces and they kind of respected each other's territory, so to speak. Sure. And of course, when we say collecting, it's, it's very easy to lose sight, isn't it, of the fact that these days, if we want to collect folklore, we go out and we take photos or we film it or we can make an audio recording of what's going on. But back in the 1920s, 30s, when Helen was collecting, it was a much longer and more involved process, wasn't it? 
Oh, it, it certainly was. And actually, she didn't even have a recorder when she first started out. All she had was she had um, gone to, had some musical training, and she could sing a little bit and plunk a few tunes out. And she took a, a melodeon with her, and actually uh, the melodeon, you had to crank it and play it at the same time. So she would sort of transpose those songs that she was hearing uh, on the melodeon, and then she would make the the notes from that. And you know, sometimes she was bang on with the with the melody or whatever, and other times she was off. Um, but she tried her best, and so some of those very first songs that she did collect uh, didn't have any recordings of them at all. It was just from her head what she was hearing, and she put them put them on paper as best as she could. So. And was she was she working and collecting for somebody, or was she purely an independent researcher and collector? Uh, she started out collecting uh, just for herself, just out of an interest uh, that uh, Henry Henry Monroe had uh, told her about, and um, she really didn't know what she was looking for but as time went on she sort of figured things out and whenever she asked for the ballads or the child ballads or the old songs people didn't really didn't know what she was talking about so she started asking questions like um do you know a song with a um a white steed in it a strong white steed and they would say oh yeah i know a song about that so she started to ask specific questions about specific types of songs and and her informants would would then uh, sort of uh, remember songs that they knew with that in mind so as as time went on though um in about 1932 she met a person in Doreen Senior in Halifax. Now, Helen um, had been sort of a local radio celebrity, and she uh, told stories and became known as Aunt Helen on the radio. Uh, and she had published some small stories that, that she had written. This is before she really got into folklore. But um, she went to an author's uh, uh, gathering, and she became quite known for being an author and she ended up meeting uh through various connections doreen senior who arrived in halifax in the summer of 1932 and she doreen was a friend and a disciple of maud Car carpels who was a folk and country dance instructor so doreen senior was a member of the english folk and uh folk dance and folk song society and she was uh, she had a career as a music teacher and she also made really good use of the publication by Cecil Sharp, Folk Songs for Schools. So when she came to Nova Scotia, she was actually um, uh, hired to teach school children some of the old English folk songs, uh, folk dances. So she was also had an interest in, in folk songs as well. So her and Helen uh, ended up getting together. Uh, Helen kind of had taken over, I guess, from Roy McKenzie as the leading folk song collector in Nova Scotia. And uh, she was actually, at the time, awaiting the publication of her first collection, Songs and Ballads of Nova Scotia. Um, but she wasn't a trained musician. And of course, she did play the piano and she did her plunking out in the melodeon. But she really struggled to capture those traditional tunes that she encountered. So she could see that Doreen had the knowledge that she didn't have. So uh, they went out on the road together uh, to collect some stories when Doreen was here in Halifax when she came here to teach. And their first uh, trip actually was to Cape Breton Island. Um, they traveled in the family car and they named the family car actually uh, they named the car cecil sharp in, in honor of the english collector so uh, they were trying to emulate his work basically so they did they set out uh, uh, in 1932 in cape breton and they collected uh, some songs in gaelic and um a, she published them later in the uh, gaelic songs in nova scotia as well so that was a, a very uh, very productive trip for them both yes i'm sure but uh, and before before this helen is is traveling alone to collect her stuff um 
so that must have had its own difficulties uh, for for a woman traveling alone at that time perhaps um she she was very careful if she traveled alone most of the time she took someone with her like her mother and uh because it, this is you know the in the 1920s and and young women didn't travel much alone and or if she did travel alone it was to a place perhaps that she was familiar with and she knew she knew the people so she did have to be very careful uh, as a young woman uh, traveling quite often um she would have to uh, make friends with the wives of if there was a male person that she was collecting from because she knew that she would be seen with great suspicion if she were to approach the male uh, or the husband by herself. So quite often she had to chat up uh, the wives and, and that uh, in order to get some of those songs and stories. She also had to be careful how she dressed. And she also dressed um, uh, quite uh, neatly, I should say. And, and because she had to make a good impression and she had to be seen as... Um, you know, being uh, friendly and a good, good person. Did she come across as well kind of cultural difficulties? Because this was, um, she was collecting songs from a very kind of patriarchal collection of, of singers, I guess. So were they reticent to let her collect certain songs that were perhaps seen as, you know, not suitable for a young lady's ears? Oh, yes, yes, she did. Um, Helen collected... Uh, uh, from many different cultures. Uh, she had extensive work actually with the Gaelic, Acadian, Mi'kmaq, English, German, and African Nova Scotian uh, traditions and cultures. Uh, it, one time she did go to collect stories from the Mi'kmaq, which is uh, the indigenous community here in Nova Scotia. And uh, she was told she could go collect the stories. It was after a funeral. But she was given permission to go collect the stories from someone. And when she got there, she realized uh, she was getting the cold shoulder. And she realized that really they had not finished mourning. And so um, she, she did leave. But it sort of uh, gave her a little bit of a reputation as someone who would come at an in inappropriate time to collect uh, songs and stories. But, uh, you know, it it was it was a sign of the times and also of Helen's lack of uh, cultural appreciation in some ways uh, she didn't know of certain rituals and stuff with certain cultural uh, groups because she you know was born uh, and brought up as you know Protestant and and, uh, and in a, in a diff different economical situation than, than perhaps some of the people that she was collecting from. So there were sometimes there were a bit awkward moments there. And uh, she had, she soon learned to be very, she soon learned to be very uh, careful about things like that. And uh, there was another time too, she actually was collecting wartime stories uh, during the war. Uh, she was given a grant to go out and collect some war stories. She also did reports for the war effort as well. But she was um, collecting songs and that from the from the Navy here in Halifax. And mostly what she ended up collecting were probably uh, more instrumental band type tunes. Uh, because a lot of people wouldn't sing the Navy songs for her because some of those songs were very bawdy and uh, you wouldn't sing that to a lady. So a lot of the sailors wouldn't wouldn't uh, sing some of the songs, but they did sing a few um, and Helen would um, sort of X out the bad words. Uh, say, you know, uh, the S word, for instance, you know, the S-H-I-T. And uh, the person who she was sending them to, Marius Barbeau, he, uh, of course, would realize that that was a swear word, right? And he would sort of guess what it was. But there was one time when she didn't know a word, and she spelled it right out, and it was the F word. Mm -hmm. And uh, she had no idea what that word meant. It wasn't in her vocabulary. She had never heard it before. So that uh, was kind of humorous, I suppose, mm -hmm. when Marius uh, received that and saw it spelled out. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm sure. Yeah. 
so that's a, it's sort of an example too of you know what she grew up with and the type of life that she lived and uh you know the things her ignorance of things she didn't know uh, but she you know she tried to be very fair and very careful with everything that she collected and even um to the to the point where when it came time for uh, the traditional singers, say, to to sing on CBC radio, for instance, you might have professional singers singing some of the traditional tunes and then the informants, uh, you know, singing the original tunes. So the, 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 the folk people singing the tunes. And Helen always made sure that um, her informants were paid for their singing and they were paid the same rate as the professionals were so that sort of thing she was very careful to um to try and get those singers you know some some money if she could so she didn't set out originally to collect stories she set out originally to do this to collect these songs but then she starts to collect more stories and superstitions you say later on as she goes on um oh yeah as as a storyteller yourself, um, mm-hmm. you obviously have a, a good appreciation for that side of Helen's work. Um, can you give us an example of one of the stories that she collected? Sure. She collected uh, quite a few stories, but one of the, the most famous kinds of stories that she she collected was certainly supernatural stories and her most famous book is called a blue nose ghosts and i have told many a blue nose ghost story and i've even taught the stories to kids who have created sculptures based on the stories that they've learned and it's it's fantastic the different ways and different things you can do with blue nose ghost stories but I'll, i'll tell you one that's one of my favorites there was an island at the mouth of Halifax Harbour, and on that island there lived a man named Casper Henneberry. Now Casper, you know, had a party one night, a few of his buddies over, and uh, there was a little drinking going on, and Casper decided to step outside for a few minutes. Well, it wasn't long coming back. He flung open the door and he yelled, oh, we're done for, boys. What would he mean? Everybody stopped. Well, said Casper, I've seen it. He said, I've seen the devil. I've seen the devil in the shape of a halibut on the side of the house. We're done for, boys. Now, as everybody knows, a halibut is a pretty ugly looking fish. And some people even say it's the devil's fish. Well, the party broke up and everybody was a bit upset, but that was the way it was. The next morning, Casper Henneberry got in his boat and he went out to Halifax and he told his story to the people along the waterfront, to the people along the docks, and they were like, oh, go away with it, Casper. And he said, no, no, he said, it's true. I saw the devil in the shape of a halibut on the side of the house. He said, that doesn't bode well. Well, the people soon found out that indeed did not bode well. For later that day, they found Casper Henneberry in his boat, well, half in, half out. His shoulders were down and his head was down in the water. He was drowned. They pulled him up out of the water and laid him in the boat and they hauled the boat with Casper's body back to Devil's Island. And as they pulled the boat up, on the sandy shore of the island, they looked down and there they saw hoof prints in the sand and they knew it was a sign of the devil. And so from that time on, that island at the mouth of Halifax Harbor was called Devil's Island. Excellent, thank you. <laughs> now, as, as well as collecting the um, normal standard folk songs that you would expect uh for for this time i know helen also collected some more dramatic kind of story based songs as well um helen did um collect the typical you know broadsides the child ballads uh but as well she often found new songs songs that she had never heard before 
her or Doreen had never th heard before. And sometimes they didn't really appreciate uh, the songs at the time. They didn't realize that uh, they were valuable in their own right. And one of the songs that Helen collected was uh, the Nova Scotia song or Fair Alta Nova Scotia. She collected it from uh, Mrs. Dennis Greeno on the eastern shore of Nova Scotia. And um, it's become sort of the unofficial folk song of Nova Scotia. And it goes a little bit like like um, this. Farewell to Nova Scotia, the sea-bound coast. Let your mountains dark and dreary be. For when I'm far away on the briny oceans tossed, will you ever heave a sigh and a wish for me? Now, at the time, a lot of uh, the school children were learning this along the eastern shore. Um, and Helen just thought it was, you know, one of those songs that the kids sang or one of those songs that was particular to a community. But she later found out that the song was actually related to a Scottish uh, song or poem called The Soldiers Adieu by Robert Tannehill. Uh, he lived 1774 to 1810 in Paisley, Scotland. And Helen never really knew about the Scottish co connection or never even thought about it until she met Queen Elizabeth in 1976. The song was sung for Queen Elizabeth. As I said, it was uh, the unofficial Nova Scotia folk song. And the Queen asked her whether Farewell to Nova Scotia might have Scottish origins. But Helen wasn't able to tell her until two years later that it indeed did. After doing some research, they realized that um, it was indeed the same, a similar tune, but different words. The Tannehill poem or song was this based on the life of a soldier, whereas the Nova Scotia song had been adapted and changed to be about the life of a sailor. So uh, the soldiers ado, uh, I'll just, uh, just sing a little verse of it so you can uh, a little bit uh, sure. see how it relates. The trumpet calls to war's alarms, the rattling drum forbids my stay. Ah, Nancy, bless thy soldier's arms, for ere morn I'll be far away. So it you can see the similarities there. The words are different, but the sentiment or the idea is, is very much the same. Absolutely. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. And uh, I do have uh, um, a recording of that song. It's actually an actual field recording that Helen collected by Walter Roast. And uh, perhaps your listeners would like to hear it. Farewell to Nova Scotia, the sea-bound coast. Let your mouth not. <laughs> Farewell to Nova Scotia, the sea-bound coast. Let your mountain dark and dreary be. For when I'm far away on the briny ocean tide, Will you ever heave a sigh and a wish for me? The sun was sinking in the west. The birds were singing on every tree. All nations seemed inclined for rest. But still there was no rest for me. I grieve to leave my native land. I grieve to leave my comrades all. And my ancient parents who I've always held so dear. And the bonny, bonny lassie I do adore. The drums they do beat and the war do alarm. The captain called, we must obey. So farewell, farewell to Nova Scotia churn, for it's early in the morning, I'm far, far away. I have three brothers, they are laid at rest. Their arms are folded on their breasts. But a poor simple sailor just like me 
Must be tossed and driven on the dark blue sea. So farewell to Nova Scotia, the sea bum coast. Let your mountains dark and dreary be. For when I'm far away on the briny ocean toast, will you ever heave a sigh or a wish for me? So let's move on from Helen herself to the society that is now formed around her, the Helen Creighton Folklore Society. How did that society come about and, and when was it formed? Well, the Helen Creighton Folklore Society uh, was um, actually started with the Helen Creighton Folklore Festival. Back in 1989, it was Helen's 90th birthday and uh, they decided to celebrate with a festival. Now, unfortunately, Helen died on December 12th, 1989, uh, but she was thrilled about her works uh, being carried on. And it was uh, the creation of the Society Festival that went on for five years and then developed into the Helen Creighton Folklore Society. And we uh, continue to promote Helen's legacy in, in many different ways. Uh, we have uh, a program called uh, What the Folk, WTF, What the Folk. It is an unplugged open mic where people can come, they can sign up, and they can sing uh, folk songs or contemporary songs uh, based on the folk tradition. And, of course, any uh, works that Helen collected as well. And storytelling, too is is included in that and sometimes people even uh, you know say a poem or do a recitation or whatever so it's it's a really lovely gathering and a way to celebrate the folk traditions uh, we also have things like uh, grants and aid grants for folklore or folk related research in atlantic canada and for almost 30 years it's coming up for 30 years the blue nose ghost story writing contest is in partnership with the local public library here and uh, the Halifax Public Library. And it's a writing contest for youth ages 7 to 15. So they can either retell a traditional story that they've heard, say around the campfire, or has been passed down through the family, or they can write their own story kind of based on things that they've heard over the years. So that's been a very popular and very successful program as well. And we do also support the... Um, music festivals for school children around the province. I uh, believe there's currently eight or nine, and we support uh, pretty well all of them. We're, we're still trying to contact one, but we give a, an award uh, called the Helen Creighton Award, and it's for any child or group of children, choir, whatever, that sing traditional songs, particularly the ones uh, Helen Creighton collected. So that kind of keeps the next generation singing and participating and passing on the folk traditions that Helen collected. So it's a, it's a very it's, lively and vibrant um, scenario that the society is working within then. Yeah, well, we're trying, uh, you know, um, we also have our home base, uh, so to speak, a virtual home base at Evergreen House, which is part of the Dartmouth Heritage Museum. And Evergreen House was the actual house that um, Helen lived in. So that's a, a neat connection there. And um, there's lots of sales of product of the of some of the the publications that Helen has at Evergreen House, and that can be ordered online too. You know, things like um, Helen Creighton biographies or Blue Nose ba Magic, Blue Nose Magic, which is a collection of superstitions and folklore, uh, which she also compiled, not just stories and songs, uh, lots of uh, superstitions and folklore as well. And, you know, a folktale journey is a compilation of stories, or Blue Nose Ghost, which is actually one of her famous. Uh, publications and it's basically been in print since 1957 so that's how popular it's been you know songs and ballads from Nova Scotia traditional songs from Nova Scotia Gaelic songs in Nova Scotia which I mentioned maritime folk songs and um, the society itself has put together songs of the sea which are sea shanties and some ballads relating to the sea 
and uh, we pulled it out from Helen's collection. Actually, uh, Dan McKinnon is a folk singer, and he just he does tours of of Britain, and uh, he just came back, and he was the one who was instrumental in pulling these songs together, songs of the sea. And of course, uh, there's Clary Croft, who is a, another board member, and he what, Helen was his mentor, and he learned a lot from her, and he also organized all of the items in the Nova Scotia archives that Helen collected. Um, there's over 60,000 different versions of song stories, you know, folklore, bits of information uh, that Helen collected, which is just phenomenal when you think about it. And, you know, 4,000 songs. Uh, just think of what we would have lost if Helen hadn't collected those songs. Absolutely. And, yeah. And of course, a lot of them, you know, have have uh, roots in um, uh, Britain and Scotland and uh, and Ireland too. So uh, there's definitely connections in folk songs and stories being brought over, you know, to the uh, to the new country, so to speak. And you know, you got to remember that Nova Scotia is also known as New Scotland. <laughs> So there you go. Indeed, there, there are a lot of parallels, aren't there, between between the folklore we have over here in in Britain uh, and particularly in Scotland, and the folklore you yep. find in in places like Nova Scotia, Newfoundland, these sorts of areas. Oh, yes. And, uh, well, for instance, a lot of the times the songs were adapted or. Um, uh, you know, adapted to the culture or changed a little bit to fit to fit specific cultures that. Uh, you know, ended up here in Nova Scotia. Now, an example of how a folk song travels or is adapted is, for instance, Fred Redden is a folk singer here from Muscadabit Harbor, Muscadabit Valley, and Helen collected from him, and he does a song called The Wind That Shakes the Corn, which is also known as The Wind That Shakes the Barley. Uh, it's a song about, you know, the the uh, the Fenian uprising and the Irish rebellion. And in in uh, Canada here, there was some fears about an Irish or Fenian rebellion because of the um, American American Civil War. The, uh, it, it was feared that the Fenians would cross the border and invade Canada as well. So we're celebrating our 150 years of Confederation, or the birth of Canada this year. And uh, it's interesting how some of the, the songs that are related to the old country are also brought here and adapted too. So, you know, the wind that shakes the corn, the wind that shakes the barley, it's basically a uh, similar song, might be slightly different tune, but um, it, it, it certainly shows how uh, the um, things can change as they're, as they're adapted. And this one of my favorite songs, actually, The Wind That Shakes the Corn. I sat within the valley green In the glen of a hello I sat and thought I'd choose between Old air nor my love I looked at her and then I thought How Ireland was torn How soft the wind blew down down the glen and shook the golden corn. It was hard the sad news to tell of how I'd leave my home, how I would roam for many's a year far from my native home, how I would leave my own dear glen, I would leave in early morn and join them brave united men as soft wind shook the corn I tried to drive away her fears my arms around her flung a gunshot burst upon her ears from out the wild woods round 
A bullet pierced my true love's side Midst the rose bush and the thorn And in my arms my true love died While soft wind shook the corn now I have roamed for many a year Since I left my dear Glen And many the fray I fought and won With those united men As up the Glen I wandered drear Sometimes in early morn With breaking heart Sometimes I hear The wind that shake the corn Helen, Helen's work actually uh, is very important. It was very important to um, the uh, folklore community and certainly to academics. Now, sometimes uh, Helen was criticized for not what she didn't collect. Uh, for instance, some of the body songs or Helen actually also was re very reluctant um, to collect protest songs or social you know, um, protest songs, that kind of thing. And oddly enough, uh, too, she was uh, very suspicious of the folk singer, uh, Pete Seeger from the USA. And at first she, she was adamantly against any kind of collection collecting of songs or singing of songs about the labor movement, etc. Uh, but as the years went on, she did get to know Pete and she, and she certainly had cha changed her mind about things like that. But she really didn't collect those kinds of songs. And it, so sometimes she gets criticized for that. But again, you have to remember how she uh, was brought up and um, her social experience as well and cultural experiences. She certainly... Um, collected from cultures that uh, were sort of the founding, some of the founding cultures here in Nova Scotia. I, I did mention about the, the Mi'kmaq, the indigenous uh, peoples here, but there were also the Acadians, which of course were, were from France and they, they settled here in Nova Scotia, New Brunswick area. And uh, there were many songs that were passed along and she uh, collected from um, Grand Atang and uh, the Pubnico area. And that's another compilation of stories and songs that the Helen Creighton Folklore Society has put together. So we do have uh, a booklet and a CD of, uh, of these songs and stories. And interestingly enough, when this publication first came out, a storytelling friend of mine, Clara Dugas, she uh, was looking through the booklet and she found a song that her mother used to sing, but the family had forgotten the tune and the words. And she was so excited to find them here that she started to cry. And so that really lends itself to how important uh, Helen's, Helen's work was. Now, Helen also um, collected for different organizations and stuff. She um, collected, uh, some of her collection is in the library and archives um, in the States, in the Smithsonian. And she also has a collection in the um, Nova Scotia Public Archives, who, who have quite a bit of her collection, actually. And then she also did some collecting for the History Museum, the Canadian History Museum. Uh, it went by several names through the years. It's now known as the Canadian Museum of History. So she uh, certainly collected um, some very valuable works for people to use from now on into the future. And there's, there are many uh, storytellers and singers that do continue to use her materials or they're inspired to adapt her materials. Uh, right now we have a local, local um, producer who is uh, producing a theatrical production of Helen Creighton's life. Um, and 
uh, she's had things such as uh, the Broken Ring song uh, made into an opera in the 1950s. There's people like the Rankin family, Mary Jane Lamond, uh, Joel and Bill Plaskett, and other international people who have adapted Helen's songs. So it's, you know, uh, very fortunate that we had Helen and had her, had her collecting She's also won very uh, many awards over the years uh, for her collections. And she did actually become known as a doctor, Dr. Helen Creighton. But she received the Distinguished Folklorist of 1981 in Canada. She had six honorary doctorates, fellow of the American Folklore Society, honorary life president of the Canadian Authors Association, and she's also uh, won the Order of Canada. And most recently, she won the Folk Alliance International Lifetime Achievement Award in 2017. So her legacy does live on. It's wonderful, isn't it, that, that these awards are still posthumously presented for this sort of thing. And as um, researchers now, there, there are a number of these sort of collectors from the uh, early to mid parts of the 20th century, such as Helen, whose legacy and whose work is so important for us now because there's so much that has been saved because of the way that these people work. Yes, yes. And, and Helen didn't realize when she first started out that her life would change uh, to become so respected and, and uh, her work so valuable internationally. So she is definitely uh, someone to admire. Uh, I think she was also a trailblazer for women because uh, back in the day, when she was even growing up as a teenager, you know, she did unconventional things that maybe that girls did, such as, you know, she was canoeing, she went camping. Quite often her mother came along uh, with them. And uh, so, you know, she was doing things that you normally, a girl normally didn't do, I suppose. And she also became an ambulance driver in the, in the First World War. And she um, uh, drove uh, a... Uh, uh, what would you call it? Um, like, a, like a, I think it was for the Red Cross, a van when they re they went around Nova Scotia into the communities and and took care of people's medical needs, that kind of thing. It's so, like a mobile yeah. hospital almost. Yes, yes, yes. It, um, it was a caravan. I, I can't remember what it's called. Maybe it was just a Red Cross caravan. But uh, anyway, she, she did things like she learned to drive. She drove a car. She drove a truck. She drove ambulances. And uh, so. You know, she did things that, that women might not ordinarily do, including going out and collecting songs and stories in the community. <laughs> <laughs> and, and what's really wonderful about these sorts of collections as well, these days in the 21st century, I, I guess we're, we're really quick to kind of criticise uh, and put down other cultures. And, and there's a lot of conflict between cultures now. Uh, and I, I, historically, that's always been the case to a certain degree. Um, but what we can find within the work of people such as Helen, I guess, is a real celebration of these different cultures. Um, it would be nice, I think, if we can listen to... Um, there's a song medley by, uh, by Rosalie Peppard that um, you've provided us with called The Voices of Nova Scotia. It'd be nice yes. to listen to that at this point. Just tell us a little bit about all the cultures that are represented in this recording. Well, Rosalie is a wonderful singer and, and songwriter, and she's part of a... Um, a uh, her specialty, actually, is telling her stories in other words, histories, but about women, her stories. So, uh, but she also loves uh, different different cultures around Nova Scotia. And she put together this medley that starts with a, a Mi'kmaq welcoming song. And then it goes into an Acadian song, uh, German, African Nova Scotian, and then ends with a bit of farewell to Nova Scotia. So it's a wonderful little medley. And she's often been asked to sing this song at citizenship ceremonies uh, for immigrants uh, here in Nova Scotia. And it goes over extremely well. I mean, you, can you imagine being an immigrant sitting there and hearing some of your, your own cultural language being sung uh, in that um, was collected so many years ago uh, 
uh, by Helen. Absolutely. It's a, it's a really important thing, isn't it? Let's have a listen to that now. Higo higane Higo higo higane Higo Higo higane aganu dae Higo ganu dae Un capuchon, je lui donnerai Un capuchon, je lui donnerai Il danse, mon moins danse Tu n'entends pas la danse Tu n'entends pas, mon lola Tu n'entends pas, mon mélène marché Que prétend chir mougraï Chir nan kruv sa mianten art Chi que prétend chir mougraï Chir Meines Vaters Garten, du wachten schöne Blümenlein. Drei Jahre kann ich noch warten, drei Jahre sind bald dich hier. Geh nur durch Heid und Nägelein, du Beck bis auch in Schnagelein. Drei Jahre kann ich noch warten, drei Jahre sind bald hier. Gonna feast at the welcome table. I'm gonna feast at the welcome table some of those days. Hallelujah. I'm gonna feast at the welcome table. I'm gonna feast at the welcome table some of those days. The sun was setting in the west. The birds were singing on every tree. All nature seemed inclined for rest, but still. For me, farewell to Nova Scotia, the sea-bound coast. Let your mountains dark and drear I be. For when I am far away on the briny ocean tossed, will you ever heave a sigh or a wish for me? Will you ever heave a sigh or a wish for me? He go, he gane. He go, he go, he gane. He go, he go, he gane. A gane die. Ta-ho! Here in um, Halifax, this is in an anniversary year. Uh, 2017 is the 100th anniversary of the Halifax explosion. For your listeners who might not know, um, the Halifax explosion was on December 6th in 1917. It was the First World War, and Halifax being the second largest uh, harbor in the world, often uh, had convoys in it, 
a couple hundred ships at a time would would uh, sit in Halifax Harbor to get ready to form into convoys to go over overseas uh, for the war effort. Quite often there were, um, you know, hospital ships and supply ships and things like that as well. But there were also uh, other kinds of ships that uh, uh, sailed into Halifax Harbor. One in particular was the Emo. It was a, uh, a Norwegian supply ship, and there was the Mont Blanc, which was a French munition ship. Now, the Mont Blanc came in kind of secretively into Halifax Harbor because it had just loaded up with munitions in New York. And loaded is, is the word here because even there was even munitions on the deck. There was like TNT and benzene and uh, it was the whole ship was full of explosives and it was headed for the war effort but it didn't make it because the Emo and the Mont Blanc collided in the narrows of Halifax Harbor and the Mont Blanc uh, floated towards the Halifax North Shore and caught fire be from the collision and exploded now it was the largest man-made explosion before the atomic bomb. It uh, was huge and 2,000 people were killed in that explosion. Mostly, most of them, the people were children, school children who ran to the windows to see the ship on fire in the harbor and many other people who ran to the window to look. And of course, when the explosion happened, the glasses glass all broke and people were blinded so uh, it, many many people were also wounded as well so the Helen Creighton connection is that she almost lost her life in the Halifax explosion she was uh, it was in the morning it happened around 906 in the morning so Helen was in bed and she was about 18 years old at the time and her cousin had stayed over and they were both both in the bed as you know uh, you did back then and um so they were both in the bed and all of a sudden helen woke up and a voice came in her head and she said to her cousin quick duck under the covers and they dove underneath the covers just as the explosion happened. The windows were blown out in the bedroom. And when Helen came out from under the covers, there was a piece of the window casing that was embedded in the pillow right where her head had just been. So she survived the Halifax explosion. And luckily she did, or she would never have collected all the songs and stories that we now have. So, but we, but she did, and we do have this wonderful collection. And uh, the Helen Creighton Folklore Society obviously is is really keen for this collection to be accessed, to be used, to be to be saved yes. for future generations. If people want to find out more about Helen and her work and about the society, or they want to um, buy some of the CDs or books or collections that that Helen produced over her time how should they do that the best uh, way is probably to go on the helen creighton folklore society website and follow some of the links that are there they've been sort of uh, linked and pulled together to make for easy access you can also certainly check out the smithsonian the smithsonian in the u.s the museum of history in ottawa and the nova scotia public archives in halifax but um, it can be difficult to navigate some of that. So if you just go on the Helen Creighton page and follow some of the links that are there, uh, it's probably the easiest thing to do. And there's also a link uh, to purchase product at Evergreen as well. And certainly you can ask a question or whatever uh, through our website or our Facebook page, the Helen Creighton Folklore Society Facebook page. Um, and we'll be happy to help as best as we can. If we can't answer your query, we can certainly steer you in the right direction. Excellent. I'll put links to both of those uh, places in the show notes for this episode and on our website uh, so mm -hmm. people can just follow those and draw them along. Cindy, it's been brilliant talking about this. Thank you so much for coming on. I'd just like to finish, if we can, 
um, by just listening to one more thing which I'd like you to tell us a little bit about and that is uh, a song called Still the Song Lives On um, which I think is a good way to wrap up because it was written about Helen. Yes, it was. Uh, Clara Croft certainly mentored under Helen, and uh, when she passed, it took several years, but he uh, wanted to write a song about her and the importance of continuing to sing and tell the traditional material that she collected. And certainly here in Nova Scotia, uh, her songs and her collection continue to live on. I take a lifetime, turn it into song, to hold it captive deep within my breast, and I call it to me. Whenever I can't see your face For the words recall What time can't erase And I remember All the joys and laughter All the times of sharing from a life now gone And the sweet, sweet music So pure that I forget to breathe Though the singer's gone Still the song lives on I take a lifetime, toss it in the wind To watch the sorrows falling to the ground But the times of gladness float upon the breeze so high to become as many songs as there are stars in the sky. And I remember all the joys and laughter, all the times of sharing from a life now gone. And the sweet, sweet music So pure that I forget to breathe Though the singer's gone Still the song lives on And I remember All the joys and laughter all the times of sharing from a life now gone And the sweet, sweet music so pure that I forget to breathe Though the singer's gone Till the song lives on Though the singer's gone Still the song lives on Folklore Podcast is created and hosted by me, Mark Norman. Find out more about my writing and research at www.facebook.com slash marknormanfolklore. The Folklore Podcast art director is Melissa Martell. Find her work at www.mdmcreate.com. The Folklore Podcast will always be free to listen to, 
but it is an enormous amount of work to research, create, record and write two of these episodes every month. And so, we have created a simple way in which you can help to support the ongoing life of the Folklore Podcast. Please visit our website at www.thefolklorepodcast.com and click on support. There are various ways that you can help, and they don't all involve giving us money. Even just leaving a simple review on iTunes or other podcast apps helps to grow our audience. So please do visit and take a moment to help us to keep going. Thank you for listening. The Folklore Podcast theme music is written and performed by Gurdy Bird.